All right, very good morning. It's Tuesday the 4th of May. Hope you had a great long weekend if you're based in the UK. And just having a quick look around the markets this morning. Uh, going to talk about the close on Wall Street, some data, comments from Powell, as well as looking at some vaccine and COVID restriction news. And then we're going to talk a little bit as well about this idea and concept of sell in May and go away, and whether or not that actually uh, carries any validity in today's market environment. But having a look at the cross asset mix this morning, and the dollar's had a bit of a bounce after its weakening that was seen in yesterday's session. So the Dixie is trading up about a quarter percent. That is weighing a little bit on both major pairs. So both Euro dollar and cable in the top left are down about 30 pips on the session at the moment. In terms of cable, um, this is looking at the last kind of several trading sessions and quite a nice respect there of the trend line on the fourth test with that horizontal area from the high on the 26th the support of the period of consolidation seen towards the 28th on the eventual break on the 90th uh, a nice uh, respect of that technical zone at 139.34 yesterday uh, and quite a nice uh, rejection after that big recovery that we saw early in that session uh, to get the week underway yesterday and um, Euro dollar, fairly similar setup. It's just been drifting south in the overnight session on some of the reversal in the US dollar. Um, we trade down, as I said, 34 cents there. Otherwise, um, looking at some of the other charts in the metal space, yeah, really nice run ups that we saw in the lights of uh, silver, gold yesterday. So, in the pressure space, uh, just having a bit of a rejection here of the recent top end of the range looking at gold which also coincides roughly with around the 1800 psychological level but the area that's been restricting going back to that double top that was originally printed on the uh, 21st 22nd of April and so at the moment as far as gold is concerned it's had a bit of a pullback on some profit taking after initial test on that level uh, we've drifted back south down towards 1783 which has been a relative level uh, of some technical relevance throughout um, the last kind of several weeks, but we're just residing at pivot in the futures for the time being. Otherwise, in the US equity market, we did close uh, mixed on Wall Street last night. The S&P was up about a quarter percent, the Dow outperforming up seven tenths compared to the NASDAQ, which was down about four tenths of one percent. Um, economy sensitive cyclical S&P 500 sectors, so consumer staples, energy, materials outperformed the likes of housing, growth stocks, um, including technology, communication services. So if anything, the, the, the sector movement would be representative of a kind of reopening trade idea. So some of those growth tech um, momentum based stocks just coming out of those. So the likes of Tesla were down quite heavy yesterday. Amazon was also uh, lower. Looking on a technical perspective at the S&P 500, um, you know, without getting too chopped up in the uh, intraday noise, um, important technical level here just being respected going back over the course of the last three weeks or so is around 41.67 in the S&P 500 future. You can see here that's defined really the bottom end of the um, period of consolidation that we're in at the moment having moved up to the recent record all-time highs. Uh, that area, though, has been a good level throughout kind of mid-late April through May, um, early May thus far. Uh, and so we continue to keep an eye on that as we go through uh, the rest of this week. Didn't really get down close to it yesterday, not quite that low. We actually saw a low print in the overnight Asia pack session of 41.72. And that area today, looking on the daily pivots, You've got that, that good defined area of technical support at 41.67. As you can see there with that green line, you've got the um, that coinciding roughly with the S2 as well on the daily pivot. So we eyeing that up as a strong level of support today's session. If we come back down, be interested to see how the market respects it around that point. Otherwise, though, as you can see, I mean, moving back on up, if we continue to, to rally from here, uh, just have a look at uh, a horizontal area, probably around 81 and three quarters. If we continue to put in a bit of recovery here, be interested to see how we respond around this previous level of support and resistance. And then above there, push up towards pivot. Not pivot, not a great deal of relevance in near term um, price respect over the course of the last uh, session or so. Uh, but just psychologically got pivot uh, and then the push up towards the R1 would mark that peak that we saw going into the latter hours of US trading session yesterday 
Um, so around 1.4197 uh, uh, as an upside target there on that side. Uh, otherwise, elsewhere, uh, if you're looking at WTI crude, uh, I was just looking at this chart over the course of the weekend, and we obviously had that really big rally going in from the 26th when we had the, the recent low all the way up to the high that we've printed at 65.46 area back on the 29th. Uh, on the reversal that we saw towards the back end of last week, saw a really nice respect, and we have done yesterday as well around the 50% fib of that move the low on the 26th to the high on the 29th and at the moment in terms of near-term price uh, we're finding a bit of resistance in that session as well um, yesterday and in the overnight asia pacific, pacific session at 64 69 which is also around the high that we saw um, in the morning of last friday and last week so we continue to eye that as potential uh, resistance there interesting on the upside Beyond then 65, a couple of areas there. You've got the previous high seen in that overnight session Thursday into Friday last week, which coincides around the 65. Then above there, you've got the R1 65.15, uh, which also ties up nicely with that previous high that we had on Thursday night uh, as upside levels of technical resistance to push up then to that recent high of 65.46. On the flip side, I'd be looking for some nice resistance or support around the 64 handle. Um, pivot but also those previous high on the 3rd and the lows on the 29th uh, and then as I said the, that um, 63 handle with 50% fib on that move would also be an area of support that I'd keep an eye on uh, as well for the time being. At the moment as far as like oil or equities are concerned I don't really have too much of a bullish or bearish view <coughs> if anything prefer prefer to see the technical respect to some of these areas so gold on that high equities on the range low oil on the, respecting the range high uh, and for the market to remain in a degree of consolidation for the moment at least would be the way i prefer to kind of look at things for the time being um, but let's just take a quick recap then of, of what happened yesterday as i said relatively mixed in terms of the um, the actual close the other performance was in the nasdaq one thing to be aware of over the weekend that might have helped that reopening trade kind of philosophy in terms of <clears throat> the sector individual stock movement is the fact that confirmed coronavirus cases in the US rose at the slowest pace since the pandemic began in the week ended on Sunday. Uh, so further positive developments there. It led to New York and neighboring states, New Jersey and Connecticut will lift most coronavirus related restrictions on businesses by the middle of this month. Um, elsewhere as well in mainland Europe, one of the other bigger countries was Germany. They plan to exempt fully vaccinated people from pandemic restrictions by by next week. In fact, uh, this all in contrast to what we're seeing still in the likes of India, where daily deaths hit a record of just shy of 3,700 on Sunday. But the number of cases has slowed, thankfully, uh, to a certain degree. On the vaccine side of things, um, one thing that has come out uh, is just so you're aware, the US FDA, they are set to authorize the use of Pfizer BioNTech vaccine to children 12 to 15 years of age as early as next week. If the authorization is granted, the CDC Prevention Vaccine Advisory Panel will meet the following day in order to review that data and pass judgment and make their recommendations. Um, the other thing for yesterday, two things really, were some comments out of the Fed Chair Jerome Powell and some data. So starting off with Powell, um, himself and New York Fed President Williams stuck to the script, basically, acknowledging decent progress has been made in the economy, which we've kind of heard before in that recent Fed meeting, general um, mild case for optimism at this point, but without then getting too hawkish, um, suggesting that they're not out of the woods yet, as he so said, uh, and not quite to the point where the Fed can withdraw support. So nothing really too surprising there. You did have some data yesterday. Um, US uh, ISM manufacturing PMI came in at 60 spot seven, quite a bit weaker than anticipated 65, but activity growing at a slower pace in April was apparently restrained by shortages of inputs as rising vaccinations against COVID a massive fiscal stimulus unleashed pent up demand. Prices paid in particular on the inflation side, 89.6 above the expected 86.1. And for the employment component, which is watched obviously ahead of 
the labor report, which we'll get on Friday, non farms, that actually fell to 55.1 from 59.6 and was below the expected 61. Point five, uh, And again, this comes in context with a lot of people looking for a fairly big number towards the 1 million marker when we get payrolls on, on Friday as the economies have continued to reopen. A um, few other things then. Overnight, we did have the RBA meeting. Um, the actual movement that was seen in the Aussie dollar really was fairly muted. Uh, I don't think any of this comes as a great deal of surprise, much as that we're seeing with other central banks at the moment what we're going to see from the Bank of England as well later on this week. They've upgraded their economic outlook. Um, they will review whether to roll over its yield target bond, uh, its yield target for the bonds, or undertake further quantitative easing in July, while maintaining that interest rates will remain at emergency levels until at least 2024. So again, it's this idea of at the moment, this is quite uniform, I guess, for central banks in general. Things are getting better. They're going to improve the kind of underlying numbers of those near-term forecasts and that near-term horizon uh, going forward. However, interest rates are not going to rise for a long time. And in this case, not until at least 2024. And then they can have some conversations about the kind of yield curve control and other unconventional measures as time goes on in the coming months. Uh, the bank, the RBA, is, um, is due to release its quarterly update with its economic projections on Friday, just as a guideline. Uh, the other thing I wanted to have a quick chat about was this idea, now we're in May, and obviously we've had a trading day of May already yesterday, but for any UK people coming in, um, you might have heard of this saying before, sell in May and go away. It's this idea going back in, in recent history that bankers typically would sell in May, close out positions to enjoy the summer, and it almost becomes self-fulfilling in the olden days that then if none of the bankers were around, no real business goes on, some central banks typically would even not have meetings purposefully not in the month of August, things like that. Um, and it was quite a uniform thing which would impact just general trading volumes and direction. Now, the idea being then is you sell in May and you don't come back until kind of late September and really October. St. Ledger's Day is kind of the marker for that in the middle of SEP. Um, now, statistically speaking, there's a few things to be aware of here. Um, this, this kind of stock market pattern through six months from May to October is actually seasonally um, going back in time over the last 70 years, um, the worst period in terms of what a, a six month period within a year from a seasonal perspective could be. Interestingly though, over time, of course, stocks generally go higher. Um, November, April, in fact, is the best time for investors generally on an average basis with returns of around 7%. May to October, so this period we're referring to, is the, is the worst, 1.7, albeit still a positive change over that period. So since the 1950s, the S&P 500 has gained 1.7% on average during those six months. There's a couple of things here, though, to... to kind of quell the idea that it's a good investment strategy to just simply sell in May and go away. And for one, the S&P 500 has closed higher during the month of May in seven of the past eight years. And actually, when you start looking at the numbers, perhaps it's more prudent to talk about selling June rather than selling May, if you're actually looking at the month-to-month -month performance indicators. Stocks have gained, <coughs> as you're looking at, in some of these, this table now, stocks have gained eight of the past 10 years um, during May to October. Um, when April is up more than 5%, as it was obviously last year, because remember we hit that end of March low in the stock market route in the pandemic, and then we really rallied from there. So when April is up more than 5% like it was last year, the next six months are generally up 6.2% on average over the last 70 years well above 1.7 seen over the more longer term average when you take in that consideration of the prior year. Post-election years, uh, as we are in at the moment with Joe Biden, um, they averaged 2.4% during those worst six months, so also better than the average 1.7. Then when the S&P 500 closes in a new monthly high, like it did um, this year, the next six months do much better, up 5.6%. So plenty of statistical evidence has suggest that 
uh, perhaps that's not the most prudent strategy at this point in time. And that's not to forget <coughs> that we've still got lots more reopening generally to happen globally with more fiscal stimulus of a large magnitude coming out of the US as well. So albeit a lot of that's been priced in, I still think the former is the one that's um, still got a long way to run at the moment, the reopening trade. So just thought I'd point some of that out. Uh, there is a full report on this that's quite interesting if you'd like to have a read. Um, I actually tweeted it, my handle here, um, yesterday if you want to have a read. Quick look at the session for today. So we've already had the RBA. In terms of the UK data, 9.30, these are the final manufacturing PMI numbers, so not looking really for any market movement there. And then going into the afternoon, no major 1.30s coming out of the US. Um, you've got the goods trade balance figure. You've also got the uh, revisions to durables for March at three o'clock. So probably factory orders is the main um, order of the day in terms of scheduled US data. That'll be at three o'clock, expecting a bounce back up to a positive 1.3 for minus 0.8% month on month. Uh, you've even got the weekly API inventory is due later on this evening. Speaker wise, uh, Mary Daly from the Fed, a voter, is partaking in the Q&A session at 6 p.m. London time. <coughs> Excuse me. And then earnings wise, Pfizer, Conoco, Phillips, and Marathon Petroleum all coming out pre-market today in the US. Uh, but gonna leave it at that. Don't forget, if you're part of the Amplify Live community on the Discord channel, check out the technical chart area, intraday, medium term, and single stock charts. I'll be updating those throughout the morning. Otherwise, welcome back. Uh, good to be with you again. I'll see you in the chat room and have a good day ahead. Thanks very much, guys.